Today, uh, we will have the last of three common Greco-Roman relationships that the Apostle Paul speaks into as he addresses the Ephesian believers, uh, so those who are Christians in Ephesus. We've talked about the relationship between husband and wife. We've talked about the relationship between parents and children. And now we move on to a relationship maybe that we cannot ourselves necessarily relate to, but the relationship between masters and bond servants or slaves. Now, before we get into this passage, I do want to make note of something. Bond servant, which is a word that can be used interchangeably with the word slave, especially being here in the States, the context of where we live, can bring about a lot of different uh, emotions, right? And even a, just a natural tension that comes up when we hear the word slavery, especially when we think of racism and different things that are going on in our world, not just in the United States, but in the world, but specific to the United States with our history of slavery, the evil of slavery that happened at the hands of those who really kind of started our nation, right? Uh, that it was a part of their context. It was a part of the history of uh, the country that we live in. So I share this because I just want to make absolutely clear that as Paul addresses this relationship between master and bondservant, the Bible is not in any way condoning or prescribing slavery. Okay? It's not condoning slavery. Though some have tried to use passages such as the one that we'll look at today to somehow justify it. Even worse in American history, I, I don't know if you've been to the Bible Museum right here in D.C., but I remember when they had an exhibit called the Slave Bible. And the whole exhibit was kind of dedicated to things that the slave masters would do to try to keep their slaves in order. And one of the terrible, heretical things that they did was they would actually change passages and words in the Bible to try to get the slaves to see, say, or, or the slaves to see, or believe that God was saying that they had to just be absolutely obedient to their masters no matter what they ask of them, no matter what they do to them, etc., etc. And so people in the world are always looking for ways to leverage power, right? It's I want to be above other people. I want to show that I'm superior. And if I have even somewhat of authority, it's so tempting, isn't it, to take that little bit of authority, wherever you might have it in your life, and then to pervert that and make it all about how you can gain more, how you can benefit yourself. But what God is trying to tell us, especially even through this passage and what we've been looking through, is that no matter what your role or your status or your position is in this world, He, if you have a relationship with the one true God, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, then you cannot operate in the power and authority dynamic that the world presents. We have to live in a true reality of what it means to follow Christ. So no, Paul is not writing to condone slavery. He's writing to the specific context in the Greco-Roman society where there was bondservant and master. And yes, within the Roman Empire, they estimate that one-third or more of the population was made up of slaves. So remember, Paul is writing to the believers here. So if you are a Christian that has bond servants, or if you are a bond servant yourself and you are a Christian, this is who Paul is addressing in this passage. And ultimately what this means is Paul is speaking into this master and bond servant relationship and dynamic, and he's calling for something radical. He's calling for something radical to those times because a faith and relationship in Jesus Christ was meant to affect every area of life, every other relationship. And so Paul will say that in God's eyes, he does not see the slave master as above a bond servant or slave. In the family of God, there is no favoritism there is no partiality. And so he's going to ask of and command of those 
believers who are both masters or bondservants to ultimately serve the one true master, which is Christ himself. So let's get, go ahead and get into this passage in Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to look at verses 5 through 9 together. And this is the word of God. Bond servants, <clears throat> obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service, as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord whether he is a bondservant or is free. Masters, do the same to them. Stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. Let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you that there is no partiality in you, in your love, God, we thank you that in your family, no one person is above the other, no one person is below the other, because God, you are the master that we serve. And we call ourselves bond servants or slaves to Christ, not because you have forced us into it, but because we devote ourselves to you, because you are worth everything in our lives. To follow you, we would throw away everything in this world, it means that we follow you, God. Help us to have that kind of heart that is so committed to you and to the purpose with which you have called us to do so that in our relationship with you, truly we'd make an impact in our families, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our friendship groups, to those who are under us in our workplaces, to those who are above us, our bosses in our workplace, that every relationship will be touched by the awesome grace and love and justice of God. So help us, Lord, as we go through this passage, <clears throat> to, to keen in on that and to know that you are speaking to each one of us to humble us, to remind us that living out our faith means that we take hold of the faith. And even when it's difficult, we choose to live in a radical way empowered by the Holy Spirit. So we thank you and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've learned already, and I've said it, I'll say it again, the Bible is not condoning slavery. Now, being a bondservant in the Roman Empire was different from the slavery that we had in America in that Roman slaves could eventually gain their freedom over time because as they were a bondservant, they were actually accruing money from their work. Now, that said, what was shared in common with American slavery is that bond servants were bought and owned like property at times. And they were also generally not treated very well by their masters. They often did face abuse, they, uh, you know, sexual, physical abuse from their masters. And so Paul is speaking into this context saying that for those who are Christians, those who follow Christ, there must be a radically different perspective and approach to these relationships, both from the bondservant perspective and also from the master's perspective. And all of that is put together because, as he put it together at the end of this passage, that there is no partiality in God. So we're going to start with the first thing for those who are the bondservants. The first point is there's integrity in serving and working. Integrity in serving and working. Verse 5 through 8, I'm going to read this again. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. So there's a few things that Paul is telling us here in the beginning of this passage. First he says to obey earthly masters, okay, that's the first part, and then he tells them to obey them with fear and trembling. Now, to reiterate what it means to do so with fear and trembling, it doesn't mean that you're deathly afraid of what they might do to you, because if you look more onto this passage, it says, 
with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. And so there's an aspect, again, of understanding your position in the world and saying, okay, I'm going to respect the authority of the master in this relationship. I'm going to submit myself to the fact that I am a bondservant and I have a master. And in this relationship, it's not, oh my gosh, what is he going to do to me? What are, what are they going to do to me? It's fear and trembling as unto the Lord. So God, I'm you're my master. And because of my relationship with you, I'm going to do my best in obeying my earthly master. Second, it says, with a sincere heart, right? As you would Christ. Now, what does that mean? Simply put, Again, they should not obey their master with ulterior motive or with hatred in their heart or holding anything against them. Okay? In the Marian Family Fellowship, we just talked about forgiveness. And that's a very big topic. And too often in relationships, yes, when you have been wronged or someone is over you, there is a bitterness that can grow and a hatred that can grow if left unchecked. So when he is saying, do this with a sincere heart, it means check your heart as you obey, as you serve, as you work. Is it clear of hatred, bitterness? Can you work as unto the Lord? And this is integrity in Christ. Integrity in Christ meaning because of your relationship with Jesus, you do not change based on the circumstances you find yourself in. You do not change based on the status that you gain or lose in the world, but you operate out of the love and the relationship that God has given to you through Christ by grace through faith. <clears throat> and so it continues on. He says, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers. Now, we've probably all been guilty of this at some point, right? Where when the boss is around, when the person who might mark off what we're doing, oh, he made a mistake, she made a mistake, when they're around, all of a sudden, we're on our best behavior, we're sitting up straighter than we normally do, and we're typing away, right? It's like if there's a keyboard in front of you, when the boss walks by, all of a sudden, sh sh you know, you're, you're on there. I remember one time, you know, I, I took Taekwondo. I'm a, I'm a first degree black belt. You know, I'm not showing off, but I'm a first degree black belt. Um, so don't mess with me, right? Uh, or our congregation. I got your guys back. When I was younger and I was doing Taekwondo, I remember, you know, you, there's this like, chumbi, right? You get the position and you, we just practice punching, right? You're just counting. But one day I wasn't really feeling it, okay? And so there I am in, in a horse stance, right? I'm ready. And everyone else was like, oh yeah, oh yeah, every time he counts. And I was just kind of like, you know, being, being like maybe 40%, right, intensity, okay? And I was doing that, and all of a sudden, my instructor, Master Kim, okay, he was old school, all right? He got in trouble a few times because he was disciplining the American kids a little bit too harshly, okay? But he looked at me, and we made eye contact, and I went from... Ooh, you know, like I was like ready to go. Why? Because he has, you know, his eyes on me. But then in my heart, what am I doing there? Like, you, you see what I'm saying? Like, am I just there to, to, to please him? Am I just there because, well, well I'm going to do my best only when he sees me? Or will I do my best because it's in me to want to do my best because of my relationship with God? Now, you might think, well, isn't that a weird stretch? You're talking about Taekwondo and practicing, and all of a sudden you're talking about relationship with God. But that's not a stretch. That's what integrity is. That means that in everything that you do, whether big or small, you give your all and you serve and you work to do your best because of your relationship with God. So don't just do this eye service thing, because you know why? You know whose eye is always on you? God who is your real master. So you might get away with paying eye service to people and your bosses and, and like, oh, I'm looking my best when people see and then I'm doing, you know, I'm lazy, I'm not doing anything when people aren't looking. But God sees your heart and he wants more of you and your life. It's good to be excellent in the things that you do. It's good to be excellent and work hard. 
Don't, you know, mistake grace for, oh, I don't have to work hard because he gave me grace, everything I need. No, you work even harder because of what Christ has given to you. Because you're thankful. It, it, it moves you. It changes you in how you do things. So not for eye service and also, importantly, not as people pleasers. Look, no one likes a suck up, right? No one likes a suck up. They have, you know, nicknames. I mean, you should have teased people, but like, brown nosers, right? Because you're just like, always, oh, what can I do for you? Oh, uh, people please. Oh, oh, what do you need? What do you need? We can't have other ulterior motives. What, what, what he's saying is, in this very serious relationship between bondservant and master, as a bondservant, obey as unto the Lord. Verse 8 says, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or free. So no matter what your position or status is, work with integrity as unto the Lord. God looks at the heart. So what does this mean for us as a Christian? Whatever job you're in, the easy application deals with the attitude of our hearts as we go into our workplace. For you, if there's someone who has a position of authority over you, do you only work hard when you're under the magnifying glass? Or are you only nice because you have to pretend to be nice, or you have to make those relationships at least be okay so you can continue to further your career and progress? Do you smile and, and are nice with your boss, but the moment that they're gone, you're gossiping with your coworkers about how terrible a boss they are and all the different complaints that you have under the sun about why that person is not a good boss. God is saying, don't just do things as I serve as, don't just be a people pleaser. Serve truly from the heart that has been changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Have integrity. Have integrity. Don't be one person and another person at church and at work and at school and at home. Be the same person who's been changed by the love and the grace of God. Amen? That's what we're called to do. That's how we're called to live. In every which way. Yes, even when you talk about politics. You better not be thinking, oh, my party, your party. You think Jesus, who is at the center. That's where everything has to be driven from. Otherwise, you're going to lose. You're going to lose relationships. Your, your heart's going to be filled with bitterness. It's going to be filled with anger. There's going to be all kinds of tension. So integrity in serving and working. In God's family, there is no superior, inferior, someone who has more value or less value. In Christ, we must see one another in the way that God sees us, as those he loves fully, gives his grace fully to. So have integrity. Remember who you are in Christ always. Second thing is this, it is to the masters. So I said, the second point is humility in leading and overseeing. And verse nine says this, masters do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. So we've seen the believers who are bond servants addressed, and now Paul shifts his attention to the Christians who are masters and have bond servants under them in their household. And what he's actually doing, he's calling them to show the care and love of God to their bond servants. Paul is saying for masters to do the same thing that he's just told the bond servants to do, which is ultimately to humble themselves and to work as unto the Lord, as masters of the bond servants, then to also humble themselves and serve and oversee in a way that pictures the love of God. That's why it talks about partiality. If you remember when we went through the book of James, it says God's love has no partiality. And he said, hey, when you're in church service and a rich person comes and you gather over to them and say, oh, you take the best seat. And then when a poor person comes in, you don't even pay attention to them. You just leave them in the back. That's called partiality because you're showing favoritism for some kind of reason, usually status, worldly gain, something. But in God's eyes, again, there is no difference between master and bondservant. And so what he's saying is in the role that you have, in the status that you are in, 
do so and live in a faithful way that mirrors the love of God. So he says, stop your threatening. Stop your threatening. Now this is a big one. Because when you have authority over someone, when you want something done your way, you can easily get that by threatening. Am I right? Those of us who are parents, we probably fall into this trap or temptation. If you don't do this, oh, I'm going to do this. And so there's an aspect when you have even a small amount of authority or a big amount of authority that you can use that to try to get what you want, but you do so by threatening some kind of force against someone, some kind of oppression against someone to say, look, I have the power, do what I say or do what I say or else. God is saying, no. That's how the world operates. Look, often in the world when someone has higher social status or standing, they will compare themselves to others and see themselves as better than those who are perhaps in the world below them. And it doesn't have to even be someone who's by status lower, but there are times where if you look at someone who doesn't agree with you, simply because they don't agree with you or your position, you think of them as lower than you in some kind of way. So there's always this kind of dynamic in the world where we're trying to pit ourselves against each other. Who is superior? Even the disciples wrestled with that. Remember when they were like, which one of us is going to be the greatest? Jesus, when you're the king, which one of us is going to be the right-hand man? There's always something in our hearts that where we want to elevate ourselves above other people. And there's two ways to do that. One is to try to elevate yourself. The other is to push people down. And especially when you have authority, it is easy to push someone else down. And so Paul is saying, if you're a believer of Jesus, you cannot do that. And maybe we've met someone like that, or we've experienced being made to feel small by someone who held a higher position than us. And they lorded it over us, if you will. And so when we're given authority, we as Christians must not be like that. We must have humility when we are tasked with the responsibility to lead or oversee others. That's what Paul's talking about. When we have a relationship with God, we stop viewing others as inferior, and we stop looking to ourselves as superior, and we start looking at God, who is the ultimate master. And when we look at how he viewed us, that while we were yet sinners, he died for us, that though we were his creation, he entered into creation, being fully man, though still being fully God, as Jesus Christ, God incarnate into the world. You know, how could we not humble ourselves in the way that we treat those who are under us in status. How dare we look upon someone and look down on them because of worldly status or success or whatever it might be. If God, who has the ultimate authority and position, who in fact is superior, is willing to meet us where we're at, to become equal with us in the sense of his humanity, that how much more should we be so much more gracious and loving to those around us? How can we look on anyone with partiality when Jesus died for us while we were yet his enemies, while we were his sinners? As Christians, we are never to use others as a means of gaining for ourselves. We're never to use our authority or power in the world to make someone feel less than or uncared for or not of worth or value. No, we treat every single person with dignity and respect. And if we are true leaders, true bosses, if you will, will show that same dignity and respect to whomever we interact with, especially in God's family, especially within the church. We must 
show the impartial love and care of God. And you know, that's what actually changes people even who are not Christian. When they see Christians breaking down the, the, the power, you know, just breaking down those barriers that, that the world has created about people in charge, people who are not, the haves and the have-nots. And when they see Christians in every sphere going to those who need it most, that need the help, that need the assistance, that need resources that they don't have on their own. And they say, here, look, because Christ has so lavishly given to me, I'm going to give to you. I want to serve you. I want to share with you. That's what we need. More believers who will look to those who are perhaps under them in status and to give them the love of God, the care of God. The world said, masters, your bond servants belong to you. Do with them what you will. They're a commodity. They are your possession. Do with them whatever and however you please. God says, masters, your bond servants belong to me. They're not a commodity, but a person who has value and deserves dignity and respect in the same way that you want it for yourself. I love you and the bond servants the same. I do not value them above you. I do not value you above them. I am impartial in my love and care for those who are mine. And so this absolutely changes the game in how we view power structures and authority. Because both sides, integrity, humility, when we are living out our faith, even just with just those two things, we're going to make a huge difference in the people around us. They're going to notice that there's something different about what's driving us, what's motivating us. So I ask this question as we finish. Who is the master that you are serving? Do you make yourself the master? Is everything revolving around you and gaining for self and what you would do, what you want to do? Or is Christ your master? Jesus, who loves you and cares for you with impartial love, a perfect love and grace that only he can give. Because if he is your master, then whether you have low status or high status or people under you or someone over you, in every relationship, you're going to look first to the master. And he says, yes, look at the love and, and the justice and the, the righteousness and, and, and all that I give to you. And so serve and work with integrity in your job places. There's many testimonies that I've heard of people simply working hard for the Lord. It doesn't mean being a workaholic and making job everything, but people who give their best in their work, that there are non-Christians that say, you know what, I, I notice that this guy does not slack at work. When everyone else is being lazy, when the boss isn't around, he's really working hard. She's really doing her best. There's something different about this person. And they say, hey, why, why are you like that? It's Jesus. And you have opportunity then to, to preach the gospel, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the same thing with those who are bosses. All of us here have probably had a bad boss at some point in our lives. But if we take the call of what God is saying to have integrity and to, to work and serve as unto the Lord, then no matter how bad your boss might be, as long as they're not, you know, if, if they're abusing you or doing something well, like that, I mean, obviously you have to be safe and take care of those things. But in your heart, do you just harbor ill will and complaints against them? Or in your heart, because of what Christ has done for you, still you choose to serve and work as unto the Lord. You can't do it otherwise. You know, sometimes we say, oh, this boss is so bad, I'm not going to work for him. Well, then don't work for him. Go find another job, maybe, Right? But if you're going to be there, be the worker who's going to show love and grace even to the most, oh my gosh, can you believe what he did? Can you believe what she did? Can you believe how he said this or how she did this? Don't join in with the rest of the world. Don't just be, be 
people pleasers. Don't, don't be fake. fake. Be genuine. Have integrity. Don't change based on your circumstances. Be one who is in Christ and live your life in that way. God gives you the different positions and status in life, but in, no matter what your place in life is, you have the opportunity to shine his love, to shine his light, to pursue his justice and righteousness through humility and integrity. Let's be people like that. Let's be people who serve the one true master together. Let's pray. Just take one moment, and I want you to ask that question again to yourselves. Who is my master? Who is my master? And maybe even asking that question, you feel uncomfortable. Because <laughs> you're like, oh, I don't, I don't want to call anyone my master. That's like really demeaning. I don't want to call anyone my master. You know what that means? You're probably your own master in your heart. Because you've become so accustomed to living your life for yourself and for what best suits you, that when you have even the inkling that someone else should be your master, you're like, oh, 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 hold up. That doesn't sound right. That doesn't feel right. But if you have been touched by the grace and the love of God, your heart has changed. Your status actually eternally has changed. You are a child of God. That means everyone else who places their faith in Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, they too are a child of God. You too are infinitely loved by the Creator. So say, who's my master? And if it's not Jesus, pray right now, even just over the next 30 seconds and say, Jesus, I want you to be my master. I've been playing in this power struggle of the world and that's how I've been seeing everything as oppressor and, and oppressed. And I don't want to live like that anymore. I want to be free to know who I am in Christ and let that be what motivates me at my workplace when I'm with my friends when I'm with my family. I don't want the temptation of being a people pleaser so that when I'm in the world, I look so much like the world, no one knows that I'm a Christian because I'm just blending in because that's what feels like the people want. No, who cares what the people want? What does Jesus want, the master of your life want? Stop living so haphazardly in your faith. Where it's like, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, but how I live, it doesn't really reflect that because, well, when I'm with my friends, they're doing all these things and I know that they might not be right, but I'm going to do them because, well, they're my friends and I'm with them. And when I'm at work, when people are complaining, I'm just going to complain along with them because, hey, that's in my heart too. That's just what we do at work. Or maybe you're in a position of power and you have not been treating those under you with the kind of humility and love that God calls you to do. And you've been exerting your authority over them and you haven't been a very good boss. Remember your boss, Jesus, who died for you, who gave you compassion and grace when you did not deserve it. And then go and do likewise to those who God has placed under your care. In every way, every status, every relationship, let's let the love of Christ, the relationship we have with Jesus, be the driving force. Let's pray for 30 more seconds, and then I'll close this. Father, we just thank you, God, that you are our master and that you are not a harsh master. You are not a master who abuses his power. You don't need anything from us, but you are a master who, who chose to serve us and you teach us to serve the least of these. You, you teach us even in times when it's difficult to serve and to work that we ought to do so as unto the Lord. You tell us that every relationship we have ought to be touched with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. So help us to live that faith out. God, there are some of us here who are struggling badly because <laughs> we're just so stuck in the world's view of, of power. and We're so hungry for it in different ways. We're just searching for it in different ways. And God, you're saying, stop. Look on me. 
Look on the creator, the superior one, the truly superior one who has humbled himself to serve you even on a cross. So God, we thank you for who you are. Bless our church, bless us, help us to have integrity and humility as we live our lives serving the one true master. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.